Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this session on the task force for growing together. Uh, my name is Ian Robinson. I teach at the University of Michigan, and I'm also the president of the Huron Valley Central Labor Council, basically the AFL-CIO at the county level for Washtenaw County, Livingston County, here, um, uh, Livingston, uh, Hillsdale, and uh, and. Um, one more. It's just to our west. Jackson, thank you. So what we're going to do today is several different things. We're going to share a little bit of the findings of a oh, sorry. We're going to share a little bit of the findings of a report that several of us, Denise, who's been handing out material, Howard Kimmeldorf, uh, faculty member from sociology, David Reynolds right here, myself, Tom Weisskopf, retired econ professor from U of M, and Roland Zollo, one of our colleagues from um, the Center that studies industrial and labor relations, um, produced about a year ago. And David is going to share with you for about 10 minutes what we actually found in terms of poverty and inequality trends in Washtenaw County. Then we're going to talk about our strategy for doing something about that, moving from understanding to action. Uh, and I'm going to give you a handout that breaks out the kind of task force workshops that we created, or working groups, I should say, to divide up the task of implementing the strategy uh, that we, we thought would be most effective uh, in responding to these challenges at the local level. Um, and then finally, we're going to have you give us your feedback, your ideas about how the vision that we've come up with uh, as a preliminary, basically, uh, the task force we formed had about 19 people on it. And you know, together, we came up with a vision for how to respond. But we want, at this stage in our process, to get feedback on that vision from as many people as we can who could be part of the broad coalition that would be needed to realize the, the kind of strategy that we're going to lay out. So we're going to ask you to break into small groups of maybe five to six people, circle up your chairs. Fortunately, everything's very movable here. And um, after taking a, a minute or two on your own to just reflect on three questions on a sheet of paper that we're going to hand out, we'll have you um, share with each other what you came up with, make any additional changes you want, and hand those back to us so we have all of your feedback. We'll try also to leave time at the end for a brief report back from each of your groups. But you know that can take a while. It won't capture everything that came out of your group. So if you hand back the sheets after you fill them out, we'll be able to go over them carefully and get things that maybe weren't captured in the report backs. So that's the overall structure of what we're planning. We've only got 45 minutes, so no time to waste. I'm going to turn it over to David for the first part. OK. Great. Glad to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I'm just going to quickly summarize um, what uh, we came up with in our report. And the reason why we wanted to look at Washtenaw County, our sense was it wasn't just important for Washtenaw County, but for what was going on in Michigan, because Washtenaw County is kind of uh, held up as a model. Uh, 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 our governor, uh, a lot of political and business leaders, as, as one uh, article, I believe, was in the Times said, Michigan needs to become more more like uh, Ann Arbor and less like Warren. Uh, and so we wanted to look at what, how are working people really doing in our county. And on the surface, the news is good that what we did is we compared 2005 and 2013. So the Great Recession is right in the middle here. And Washtenaw County emerges at that with more jobs. Uh, while Michigan actually had a net loss of jobs. And we had the fourth highest per capita income in the state. That's all very good. However, here's the problem uh, beginning, is that if you compare where were people at uh, back in 2005 compared to 2013, you can see only the top 10% actually gained in the buying power of their wages. Uh, everybody else uh, lost. And the, the problem is, is that the poorer you are, the more you lost ground over, uh, the la over the, those 12 years. And so today in Washtenaw County, 37% of the working uh, population does not earn enough to meet a ba basic family needs budget. And we use the Michigan League for Public Policies uh, estimate where they go and they look at how things actually cost in Washtenaw County and what you would need uh, for a family of four. And it's ironic, if a family of four, uh, if one person works, it's about 32,000. If both work because of childcare and your loss of tax, 
tax credits, you end up needing to earn about $64,000. So that was a good benchmark. And there's other people that have done this, and they, they come up with roughly the same number. So 30% um, of individual workers and about a quarter of the households are not making uh, a basic uh, needs budget. And in looking at the pattern of what is happening to the jobs that are going to uh, um, experience add the most number of jobs, uh, are predicted to add the most number of jobs, the future looks like these patterns are going to get uh, even worse. As you can see, uh, all these top jobs, uh, first of all, if you, if you take away this category here and this, these two here, you see these jobs all pay below a basic needs budget. In fact, even by the federal poverty line, a lot of those are below the poverty line. And the change in the buying power of those wages with this anomaly of business teachers, uh, again, are just losing uh, ground over, over time. And these are the jobs of the so-called knowledge economy of the future, by the way, right? Uh, that we're all supposed to be growing to, eds and meds, right? So you've got the education in green, you've got the medical in blue, and then uh, all these so-called knowledge economy jobs of the future also grow a service economy uh, with poor paying jobs. Uh, we also take a look at the University of Michigan, our, our largest employer in the county, and on the one hand, uh, kind of bucked the trend overall employment up 21%, and that's part of the story of why the county as a whole, uh, the overall employment picture has been better, and even the medium income going up. But again, the, the issue of this growing inequality is also there at the University of Michigan, where the bottom quarter of owners actually, their buying power, their wages slipped. Uh, the biggest gains going to the top 1%, and those not meeting the basic needs budget is the growing population at the U of M. And if you look at the detail on some of these um, uh, numbers, you can see uh, uh, basically... Um, you look at teaching, you can, you can see even the bifurcation there between tenure track faculty and lecturers who earn about you know, less than half of what tenure track faculty earn. You can see that unless you're in a very specialized, highly educated uh, field like tenured faculty or you're unionized, that uh, your buying power went down. And again, the people that are earning the least at the U of M are the ones seeing their wages erode the fastest. So uh, this was our concern because there's been tons and tons of research done that basically show that uh, economies that uh, have sharp inequality and that inequality grows are not healthy over the long term. Uh, it's the economies that have shared prosperity are the ones that are built on a much uh, sounder basis. So it's not just about those at, uh, the, 80% of the population seeing their buying power erode and those at the bottom seeing it erode faster, but it's really our long-term viability that's at stake. Okay. Thank you, David. So that's what we found. Um, any quick questions about that before we move on to, yeah? Well, like the kind of economy we had after World War II from 1945 to about 1975, those 30 years, as productivity of the overall economy went up, wages went up, average wages, median wages went up in parallel with it at about the same pace. So that was broadly shared prosperity. Yeah, if you were poor, you were better off. If you were rich, you were better off. And now what's happened, we can see it in our county, if you are wealthy, you get wealthier. If you're in the middle, you're eroding. And if you're poor, you're getting poorer. Yes. So um, I have uh, people in my family who uh, are people in my family. <laughs> I don't think it's any louder. I can't tell. No, no, he's, he's recording it, though. Oh, okay. People in my family uh, work in the food service industry, and uh, one person in my family who, I'll, I'll name the place, it used to be Big Ten. Okay, now it has a more fancy title, Morgan and York. Okay, never got, in the years that she worked there, never one paid day if she was sick, ne ne never a paid day if she wanted a vacation day. Uh, she was a great employee there. She did a very excellent job. She doesn't work there anymore. 
Uh, but, you know, she's lucky that she doesn't have to work there anymore, but that's so sad. You know, she did an excellent job and never, uh, she said people would come in there and say, oh, I haven't had a vacation in several months. or, And she'd say, I didn't say this back to them, but I never have a vacation. Right. Well, it's a growing share of the population of the county that don't have any paid sick days. And that's uh, her. Yeah, we, we do at University of Michigan. And, but um, I was talking to workers in the Forcia plant in Saline. It's, it's a plant that supplies the big three with auto parts. And it's, it's represented by a union, but they still haven't been able through negotiations because of their weak bargaining power to get any, any of that. So when we are now uh, have a... Uh, earned sick pay ballot initiative underway. We're collecting signatures for it. Um, that will benefit a lot of people, even union people, but a huge chunk of people who aren't. I don't know, do you remember the percentage, David? Is it 40% of the, of the state that don't have any earned sick pay at this point? And this will create, for full-time people, uh, nine days of paid sick, sick time if we get it, successfully get it on the ballot. It's very, very popular with, popul with the voters, so if we can get enough valid signatures to get it on the ballot, I think we need about 300,000. I think we can pass it, and if we pass it'll have a huge positive impact for a, for a large chunk of our population. So there are things where sometimes legislation has, is the best way forward. One of the challenges we faced, though, as a group was, as we were working on this report, the government in Lansing passed a law which basically said, County governments and city governments will not be able to pass minimum wage laws or other kind of requirements that re that require employers to schedule reasonable hours and give advance notice. Labor market regulations that we might have been able to pursue in in part to address the kind of issues that we're talking about here uh, were foreclosed by state fiat, um, and so we had to think about you know how are we going to go forward in the absence of the possibility of using the governments that we're closest to, our city and county governments, to enact laws that will help in this way. Ballot initiatives are one way. We can circumvent the you know, forces in Lansing that are dismantling our labor regulations and expanding and you know, in, in intensifying the level of economic inequality using ballot initiatives. But we also want to do stuff that we, you know, locally. And so that's kind of where we uh, got to by the time that report was issued in March of last year. We didn't want to make a bunch of recommendations about how, sorry, see your hand up? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I, I was looking actually at the woman in the back. Yeah. I just, you know, quick comment that I think we have a history demonstrating that the governor will undo things that we have voted for on the ballot. So I'm wondering, have you guys given any thought to really how do we as citizens really ensure that the things that we vote for really stand and become part of the laws? You mean things we do on ballot initiatives like emergency financial manager, for example? Yeah, I, I mean, I... You know, and we tried to raise the minimum wage at the state level, and the, the legislature intervened and raised it by less than what we were trying to do with the ballot. So there's a history of these. I'm not sure how the dynamic's going to work out with the earned sick pay. There are people who've done a lot of thinking about that. I'm not one of them, so we're, I'm supporting it. But I can't really give you a good answer to what their strategic response to that would be. Um, I want to try to focus in on what we can do locally here, though. And so I do, I do want to move on on that. But um, I think the next thing that we really said and when we ended the report, we said, we're not going to try to give a bunch of recommendations. We're going to try to constitute a task force that draws from people who are political elected people, heads and leadership of NGOs, labor people, progressive business people, and bring them together and see what they can come up with in terms of a, um, a vision for how to go forward and a strategy based on that vision. And that's what you have there, Denise. I don't think anybody's got that yet. So if you could circulate that. Um, Actually, the vision that people do have, sorry, okay. But as this is going around, it, it's got the strategy on it, so you will, we'll, we'll want to look at that in a minute. And it's also got who are the members of that task force, who are the roughly 19 people that, that were, we tapped first to try to um, make that happen. So the actual vision it was on this document, which all of you have, but while this other stuff is going around, I'm just going to read it to you so you, you know what's in there, because part of what we're going to do is ask you to give your feedback on this. So it's written from the point of view of 20, 2025, looking back. 
uh, over what we've accomplished in the 10 years since our report was written. So it says, in the spring of 2025, the Growing Together Task Force releases their Washtenaw Wage Report, a follow-up on our 2015 study. After reviewing a number of key indicators, the task force is excited to announce significant progress. Indeed, the proportion of workers earning below a basic needs budget, which you saw David showed you what that is, decreased significantly over the last 10 years, and the local economy is stronger than ever. Comprised of representatives from education, healthcare, government, business, nonprofits, advocacy groups, and labor unions, the task force came together in 2015 after the Growing Together or Drifting Apart report revealed alarming trends in falling incomes. Building a broad coalition, the task force promoted a culture of mutual thriving in Washtenaw County, where prosperity generated in the county stayed in the county. Organizers fostered a virtuous circle in which workers with family supporting wages spent locally, helping local businesses and the county as a whole to prosper. The coalition encouraged businesses to opt into high road standards, sourcing much, as much of their needs as possible locally, and supporting their employees through a thriving wage, quality health care, and ample opportunities to provide workplace voice, including unionization. Employees, in turn, were encouraged to spend their dollars at such high road businesses whenever possible and to develop their skills and education. Sharing prosperity in this way eventually became the cultural norm. To get to this point, the task force promoted $15 an hour in 2015 dollars as a basic wage floor, convinced anchor institutions such as the University of Michigan, EMU, Washington Community College, and our two hospitals to adopt this standard for their own employees and to source as much as possible possible from local businesses that meet high road standards. It worked hard to increase member and public understanding of the importance of buying from high road local businesses. And the task force also formed to maintain strong coalitional ties with other groups in the county committed to helping workers meet their basic needs, including those that are promoting access to racial e equity, healthy and affordable food, comprehensive health care, public transportation, housing, child care and quality education and training. The coalition also threw its uh, collective weight behind public policy initiatives aimed to stabilize high road local businesses in times of economic distress, to reduce racial disparities in access to opportunities to thrive, and to ensure workers a full voice in their own destiny and in the success of their employers through collective bargaining, worker cooperatives, and or other forms of worker empowerment. Much changed over the years, but one thing remained constant. The task force members' passion for and commitment to promoting dignity and equity in all facets of community life. Our work led to other positive initiatives, visions, and collaborations, and received state and national acclaim for its comprehensive approach to creating a society built on the individual's inherent rights of liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So that's the vision that we came up with from that task force. And I'm going to ask you to kind of give us some feedback on that through this sheet that I don't know if Denise has already handed that out or not. That's when you break up into groups. But before we get there, I want to say a little bit about the strategy that we so far think uh, could be used to, to advance these goals. And that strategy is on one of the sheets that we were handed out. Yes, that is exactly one. Can I borrow that for a sec? So it's on this one where, where we talk about strategy growing together. Uh, basically, it's outlining in bullet point form what you've already heard in that vision statement, a kind of positive virtuous cycle where anchor institutions purchase from local businesses that agree to get on this high road. We encourage the anchor institutions to make sure their own employees are paid at, at, at least at this minimum of $15 an hour. In the case of U of M, we've done some research and we found out that 95% of their employees are already paid above that rate. So it's really raising the remaining 5% above that threshold. And we've done some calculations that that would take about $15 million, somewhere between 10 and 15. Um, the, the annual budget of the U of M is $4.5 billion, not counting the hospital. So this is really a tiny, tiny fraction of, of the overall budget. So it's a matter of political will rather than, you know, fiscal necessity. Um, so, but with other institutions, it might be more difficult, but they're smaller and they might be able to move faster. So we need to move on multiple fronts with a lot of these anchors. Um, it's not just the big universities and the big hospitals. It's also our own governments, our own electeds, our city governments and our county government also have living wage ordinances already, but those living wages don't go as high as 15, and they're not entirely being met either. Um, there are a lot of 
summertime employees, for example, that um, uh, don't get paid that even the living wage uh, that are employed by our city and our county. City of Ann Arbor, I can't speak for Ipsy, I'm not sure, but in the parks of Ann Arbor, there are people who aren't. So that would be a matter of partly changing their own employment practices vis-a-vis -vis their own employees, particularly more contingent ones that are unseasonal in nature, but also using their power as, as, pow as, as large consumers of goods and services using that contracting power to set some conditions and say, if you meet these conditions, we're going to favor your bids. So you're actually using the economic size and might of those anchor institutions to change the incentive structures facing a lot of local businesses. So we reward them with more uh, customers from our own networks, from all the people that are part of our organizations, who we direct to support and encourage to support and explain why that's a valuable thing. But we also have these big organizations that are also providing incentives as well. So some pressure might be required to move the anchor institutions and some of the other uh, institutions in this direction, but there's also rewards for it. It isn't all a matter of um, political pressure. It can be a combination of carrots and sticks. So that is the, the basic um, vision that we're trying to move towards. You can see that that doesn't really entail passing any new regulations at the county or at the city level, which is an option that's, for now, at least foreclosed. It doesn't count on anything happening federally or state level, though goodness knows there are many things which, if they did happen there, would greatly help you know, with, the, with the concerns that we have. But these are things that we can do as citizens and as consumers and as local voters and as members of community organizations of various kinds that care about these issues. So I think that's really what I wanted to say about strategy. Uh, so let's break out, if we could. Um, can you form up circles of maybe uh, five to six people per circle? Um, but what I want to do is just have you take like two, three minutes and just jot some notes to yourself. So the questions are, in the vision that we've laid out, what vision, what stands out in this vision that Ian read to you that appeals to you and your constituency? Is it, what are two or three things? Um, well, I need one. <laughs> uh, is there anything that is changed or needs to be added to the vision? Are there red flags? Is there something you're concerned about in terms of you and your constituency supporting it? And then uh, are there specific groups in your network that you say, well, the, w th these folks need to be involved in the campaign that Ian talked about to persuade the anchor institutions to set a model for the entire county in terms of their own employment and their, their purchasing, okay? So those are the three questions. So if you can jot some notes to yourself for, we'll take about three minutes, and then I, uh, I'll give you a time's up, and then uh, we'll have you talk in your groups about the first two questions questions, can you come up with maybe one or two things from each of those questions that you want to share with the group as a whole that were kind of common ground for you? Okay, is that making sense to folks? Okay, so we'll take about, uh, we'll take about three minutes and just uh, jot some notes down um, for yourself and also when you hand it back for us on question three. Okay, it looks like folks have at least something down for the first two questions that gave you stuff to talk about. So uh, let's transition to this. So take those first, start with the first one, and I'll give you a, uh, take about five, ten minutes or so. I'll give you a halfway mark uh, warning, but uh, compare notes to number one, and is there something that's standing out that's a common theme that you want to share with the group as a whole? Okay. Like, what if some of the people enrolled in it were the people at the top socioeconomically, so that when they're, when they're, be, you know, being given a bonus or a raise, they become educators of their employers to talk about the, the sort of economic redistribution? When there is a raise, 
that should the raise be based on a percentage of the of everybody's salary or should the people who are higher up get a less percentage so the ones at the bottom get a higher percentage and then how do we make sure that that the young people because see I'm back to my education thing again understand work because if you come from and a community where there's been huge unemployment, you know, they don't see people going to work every day, then they don't learn that, you know. And because we've had this mess for so long, um, a lot of young people just don't get it because it's not something that's modeled for them. And so the mentoring, you know, maybe the mentoring might be a strategy, you know, um, or maybe that there's a way that you can create that on the job so that there's somebody actually who works with them, who's not their supervisor, but who can support them in employment, but it doesn't, so it's not, doesn't ruin their chances of maintaining employment, but they can still get that support. I don't know. So we had a couple things we talked about earlier on the second question about what to be changed or added. I heard people say needs to be a racially diverse group, um, need to be sure that they're low income people on the task force, but almost from what we're saying here is also the high income people on the task force in terms of mentorship, educa mentorship education of the high, uh, understanding and education, and then what can you give back and help with the change. And then they're losing something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, we also had something when we were talking about what could be added to the vision. We weren't sure if there, what was your question? Is there a logo? Yeah. So I'm new to town and like, what, what should I be looking for to know where I should be? We don't have such a thing yet. We have to agree on what would be the standards that would have to be met to earn such a logo. But some yeah. store people we've been talking to, some business people have suggested they would love to have that kind of thing that they could put in their window yeah. once we nail down what the standards are. And then you have to have a, a solid, reliable mechanism for making sure people really did meet them too. Mm -hmm. But if it's simple, like it's just fifteen dollars an hour, that's not so hard to verify as if it's more complicated with other labor standards right. or health care. What counts as adequate health care? That gets really tricky very fast. Mm -hmm. Ian, can you address briefly how did um, how did the task force encourage? Um, what what were the methods that they used to encourage like anchor institutions to? Support locally. What, what well, did you? What we did you do? We haven't. We're just getting there now. I mean, our biggest strategy is coalition building. Get as many people who are connected to those institutions in different ways as possible to reach out to whoever are the relevant decision makers. Like with U of M, we have elected regents. It's really helpful that they're elected. It's really helpful that six out of eight of them are Democrats, who are, you know. Not, that doesn't make them perfect, but it makes them more aligned with what we're talking about than, than if they had been Republicans. For example, EMU, all of their trustees are appointed by the governor. That means every last one of them are basically friends of the current governor and much harder to move than I would say the trustees at U of M are likely to be. So you have to look case by case and sort of do an analysis of what each institution's points of, of leverage are and where we're most likely to have allies already. You know, a lot of the institutions have unions that represent their employees, so the unions in those institutions can be valuable allies. There's, you know, we got to do that, and that hasn't been done yet. But building the coalition, we think, and then bringing the people together who are part of it to talk about, well, how do we tackle this one? How do we tackle that one? This is kind of the next stage and down this road. Is there acknowledgement of like subcontractors? So I've done. I have my own business and I've seen this because I've tried to piecemeal my work life for a while and you know someone can I'm just curious how that's coming into the conversation like seasonal employees or people who work to teach an hour class here and then an hour class here and then that wage doesn't those don't add up so I wonder how that fits into the conversation as well. Well, that's sort of part of what we're saying when the cities and the other government entities contract out a lot of the work. It's not mainly, in many cases, done by county employees. They can make it a matter of policy that they pay a living wage to those contractors. And they can say, if we're going to buy stuff from you, you've got to pay that, too. And the living wage has to include, for a subcontractor, travel, they're paying their own health insurance, they're, you know, there's a lot that goes into it beyond $15 an hour. It's all these additional things. Yeah, so we're torn. I mean, we can add, we can start adding conditions, but the more we do, the more complicated it is to monitor and enforce 
So a, a higher wage that's simple to measure it might be the best way. All right, going, going, going. Unfortunately, we're out of, out of time. So uh, let me, I'll just go around. Let me uh, do one group at a time. Give me one of your, uh, your, your ideas. And uh, are you guys ready? So I want one idea for question one. What stands out in the vision that appeals to you and your constituency? So what's one, one thing that was common? The fifteen dollar okay. living wage. The fifteen dollar living yeah. wage. Okay. What about you guys? You can you can say yes, us too, because it was really important. Or you can say no. There's something else we want. We talked about. We want to add. Question one. Yes. <laughs> the fifteen dollars an hour. We like the clear definition, but also linking it to two thousand fifteen dollars, so that it would go with inflation. Okay. Great. Well, there you go. Go ahead, Mary. One thing that appeals to us. Well, I guess um, it was mentioned that we like the idea of helping people know who is meeting the high st high wage standards, kind uh -huh. of in the in the community. Okay. We had a lot of other issues though. So okay. <laughs> yeah. Number two. Okay. Fair enough. What about you guys? What's living wage? The living, the living wage really resonates. Yes. Okay, very good. What about you guys? We like mutual thriving and collaboration. Yeah. Mutual thriving and collaboration. Collective kind of okay. What about here? Um, we liked just big picture that it's practical and not elaborate so that everybody can understand it. it uh huh. Okay, great. What about you guys? We like the emphasis on buying locally. And sourcing locally. Okay, buy local, source spread. local. Okay, cool. What well, about you guys? Well, lo local sourcing is one of ours too. That's very important, especially okay. Nipsilani. Okay, great. All right. Any any other uh, one that stands out that's such a burning thing you want to share it that we haven't touched on? Providing the political base for successful millage increases. Okay, okay, the political base for the millage increase, recognizing governments may need help to meet $15. Yep. The languaging of thriving. The languaging of thriving, really. Yeah. And we had another one, just for buying local and on also knowing the, uh, an idea of a logo, a logo to indicate which, which are participating. Okay. All right, great. So now let's move on to question two. What are some changes, additions, concerns? And, uh, well, let's go in reverse order. I'll tell you what. what. What about you guys? Uh, on, th on that one, uh, we're concerned about healthy access, uh, access to healthy food uh, because if you are a convicted felon, you can't have access to SNAP. Uh -huh. uh, you know, food stamps for those don't know, and that's uh, that's that grows in the racial equity issue too, in terms of incarceration rates and convictions for felonies. Okay. Yes. And I should say there are members of the task force for whom that's a very important issue. Uh, what about you guys? To build on to build on the political base um, issue, public school funding isn't controlled at the county level, so uh, that needs to be changed. Okay. Great. What about you guys? Uh, Barb wondered if the right to work conflicts with some of the um, some of the empowerment of workers um, pieces of it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Leave that to you guys. I I worry about if you guys focused at all on the upper echelons of the wage earners. You're, you're focusing on the low end, mm -hmm. but have you addressed ways of or issues dealing with the high end people? Uh huh. Like asking them to take less money. <laughs> All sorts of questions with those people. Right, because our, our wage data shows the people at the top, their salaries increase uh, while everyone else doesn't keep up with the cost of inflation and goes down, right? We had a big yes. discussion here about privatization that's going on in, in pu the public arena and schools specifically. Okay. Uh, yeah. This doesn't seem like we'd really address it, partly due to the state funding, but if there'd be a way to educate ourselves yeah. about the dangers of right. privatization, how it may be penny wise but pound foolish, so mm -hmm. people don't have such knee jerk reactions to going. Okay. There. We also talked about local affordable housing so that people aren't on the road and they're here to spend their money here. Right. Saying that with sometimes as the wages go up in Ann Arbor, the price of housing prices go up too. So if that's not addressed, it's not going to help. Right. And, and just to dovetail on that, one of the sheets we handed out has a little diagram 
which shows kind of the coalition we're envisioning, this virtual cycle of raising wages and buying locally. But then there's arrows that, they're, 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 that there's all these other issues of housing and education and transportation that people are working on and wanting to ha be linked up with those efforts. David asked if there was an evaluation process. In other words, as you go along. As you go along. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay, good. What about here? We came up with the rights of agricultural workers. How would that affect this? Okay. Very important. Yes. Um, uh, efforts thing. Uh, the working poor people I know have huge issues with uh, housing cost, and uh, so if the employers were going to pay them fifteen dollars an hour, they could actually make money in the long run if they did equity shares and bought twenty or thirty percent of whatever house would allow somebody who's now renting to become a homeowner. And some of those homes aren't going to be in Ann Arbor, uh, so you need that rapid transit bus system that's much better than what we've got now, so they can get to work. I believe there's a millage about radically expanding the bus system in all of Southeast Michigan coming up. That would be a, a huge game changer for many working poor people. Okay, great. How about you guys? Whoops. You talked about public transportation issues. Okay. Um, we also talked about um, how to scale up local food to um, supply the institutions, that there's some work to be done there. Yep. How about you guys? Well, uh, something I see a lot um, in my field is uh, often uh, employees are so young, fresh out of high school or college, that they, they almost take their job for granted, a good job, maybe a $17, $18 an hour job for granted. And uh, we suggested possible mentoring, uh, you know, for these individuals, you know, um, just to tell them how important it is, you know. I mean, it was a, you know, they're just taking it for granted, I guess. Uh -huh. something. We had another member, um, <clears throat> just to, to include pl um, places uh, supportive of trauma um, and working with refugees and other, other communities who have been traumatized. Okay, great. Informed care. Okay, is there, is there anything else that, that you talked about in terms of what needs to be changed that, that hasn't been reflected you really need to share? Yeah. Um, somebody in our group brought up a really good point that um, when they're negotiating these contracts to have higher wages that uh, they should include an um, economic impact statement mm -hmm. so that uh, it shows how these new you know, contracts and bids um, work with the local economy and, and improve it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I don't need the microphone. Um, I think that part of the strategy should also be thinking about how you use media and social media to inform the community and the public so that people are aware of the disparities and um, and and how this will make life better for everybody. Okay. All right. Great. So. Um, Unfortunately, we, we're out of time, but what I want you to do is if you haven't answered number three, uh, you know, I, our sense is that there's, there's not a coalition that, that's raising this particular issue of wages. And uh, like I said, our, our initial step to use the anchor institutions to really set a model. So please, uh, we're very much in the stage of engaging in conversations and seeing who, who's like-minded and pull it together in a coalition to really move something on the ground. So uh, if you haven't uh, answered three, please, your own organizations, organizations in your network, and please drop these off on the way out because we really want to get all these good ideas. So I appreciate your uh, patience and enthusiasm in a very quick and dirty process on a very big issue, uh, but hopefully this is just the beginning of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.